Hello, MCU fans. In preparation for Deadpool 3's imminent arrival, this video is going to do a complete mapping of the X-Men timeline. Now, I have done X-Men timeline videos in the past, but honestly, it was spread out over three different videos and they're all over a year old. So, this is the complete X-Men timeline with a lot more information than even those original videos, and I've even moved one of the movies in the timeline. I'm very interested in your thoughts on that. Now, there will be some mild spoilers because it's impossible to talk about the timeline without discussing some spoilers. Just keep that in mind, but as long as you're okay, then let's dive right in and see what we can find out. Don't forget, we have an April contest running all month long. Be a subscriber, leave a comment, win a book or a steel book. Best of luck. And we have the membership option in case you're interested in helping me with my goal of doing this full-time one day. You get cool perks like early releases of videos. This very video was an early release for members only and then eventually was released to everyone. So lots of cool perks, but honestly, no matter how you support the channel, it's all greatly appreciated. Leaving comments, liking videos, subscribing, those things go a long way too. So thank you so much. All right, so the history of the X-Men goes all the way back to 1845. This scene was documented in X-Men Origins Wolverine, where we see the childhood of a Logan and a Sabretooth. And they tell us, 1845, very convenient. And Sabretooth, a young Sabretooth, is saying, we're brothers, Jimmy. Of course, that's James Howlett. That's his birth name. Do you realize that? So from this point forward in the movie, they team up together. They're together together. Well, through four wars, if nothing else, right? Through the Civil War, World War I, World War II, and the Vietnam War. Uh, and then we're going to see down the road that at the Vietnam War is where they finally end up parting ways. But yeah, very cool to see their history through all these wars. But we do have to go then back to 1944 to pick up on the childhood of a young Professor X and a young Magneto. Magneto, we pick up in Poland of 1944. Professor X in Westchester, New York of 1944. Notice very different. He's in a mansion, and uh, and Magneto is not. In fact, we see how wonderful uh, Professor X's childhood was. He's there meeting uh, young Mystique Raven, and of course there is the tragic um, childhood of Magneto in the Nazi war camps. So very very different uh, beginnings for both of them. All right. So then we see in 1945 at the end of World War II. This is a scene from The Wolverine. Uh, that Logan is uh, running from the you know, nuclear bombs. Now, that must mean that at least for this point uh, during the World War II, that he and Sabretooth were not together. They were just together at different points, but, but not here, obviously. All right, so then we finally get to our first movie, X-Men First Class. Uh, that's in 1962, and we know that because, well, they tell us it's in 1962. <laughs> Very convenient. But also it happens around the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and like many of the X-Men movies, they take real-world events and make them part of the actual timeline. So therefore, we can rely on the fact that in real life, the Cuban Missile Crisis was in October of 1962. So we even know the month that this movie is occurring. Okay, an important thing that happens in this movie is Professor X loses the use of his legs because he catches a bullet uh, in his back there. And therefore, he's paralyzed basically in 1962. Now, that will create... A couple continuity issues, though, that they do try to solve, and you can decide if they solve them well enough or not. All right, so then we move to 1973, and uh, we actually are learning this little bit of history from Days of Future Past, which we won't talk about for quite a while, but in 1973, in the original timeline, so not the rewritten one, but in the original timeline, Trask is assassinated by Mystique, and his assassination is a success, and that leads to the creation of the Sentinels, which we'll see a lot more of throughout history. Also, though, in 1973, we learned from X-Men Origins Wolverine that Logan and Sabretooth are captured because of some nefarious things that Sabretooth does during the Vietnam War. They're then offered a chance to join Team X, which they do. And, of course, we also get Ryan Reynolds in his first version of Deadpool, uh, which he will eventually kill in Deadpool 2. So more to follow on that. Now, when does this thing happen? Well, here's my guess. So first of all, this is a historical newspaper. This is not in the movie. But remember, they do seem to use history to guide the timeline. So in January of 1973, that was the end, effectively, of the Vietnam War, because that was the Paris Peace Accords. And we know from history that all GIs are out of Vietnam in 60 days. So by March of 1973, the Vietnam War is over and all the GIs have been brought home. Knowing Sabretooth and Wolverine, they were in the war to the bitter end. So I'm guessing the scenes that we see in X-Men Origins Wolverine are in March of 1973. And we're going to see that's very important when we get to Days of Future Past. All right, so then they go off, remember, to join Team X. 
But then Logan essentially decides to leave. And we don't know how long he was with Team X, but listening to what uh, Sabretooth says here, we finally got a good thing going here. Kind of seems like Logan wasn't with Team X for more than a month or two, to be honest. So we then jump forward six years later. They don't give us the year, but they do give us some good hints as to when we're talking about because the finale of X-Men Origins Wolverine is at Three Mile Island. Notice it's well before there were any issues like there were in real life uh, when with the meltdown and all. And they say no one's going to snoop around a nuclear reactor. Well, we can probably place this in the timeline because the actual Three Mile Island incident in real life was in March of 1979. And it sure seems like they're saying in the X-Men movies that the battle in X-Men Origins Wolverine is how we got the uh, Three Mile Island accident. So therefore, it certainly seems like they're saying that, that it's happening in March of 1979, which would be six years later from 1973. Okay, great. So then what else happens? Well, we do learn in X-Men Origins Wolverine that he gets his adamantium claws. He and Sabretooth have a lot of battles, obviously. We see crappy Deadpool now with the, um, his, his mouth sewn shut. Um, Wolverine gets shot with an adamantium bullet. That's very important because that's how he loses his memories of all of this. And we see Professor X walking around. Hmm, right? How is he walking around? Well, they do try to explain it in Days of Future Past because they say that in 1973, that there was some type of a treatment that Xavier was taking that lets him use his legs again. But, as Beast is saying, he loses his psychic abilities. However, he still had his psychic abilities here, right? Because he was not only walking, but using them. So presumably in 1973, it's knocked out his psychic abilities, but by 1979, he learned to use them and walk, I guess, right? Is that a satisfying answer? I don't know. I don't know. But then again, <laughs> we also see in 1986, he's still walking because this flashback is 20 years prior to uh, The Last Stand. This is a flashback from The Last Stand movie. Uh, so yeah, apparently at some point after this, he stopped using the medication which meant he couldn't use his legs anymore, but he obviously could use his psychic powers without any issues. I don't know. Tell me your thoughts if this really solved it. I'll give him credit. They tried. They tried. Uh, then this is kind of fun. This is the de-aging. You can see the before on the left and the after on the right for both Professor X and Magneto. I thought Professor X's was pretty good. Magneto's it looks a little uncanny valley creepy, but oh well. They, again, they tried. Uh, all right, so then we move to 1996, which is 10 years prior to The Last Stand, which we'll get to why that's in 2006 in a minute. But we have a scene with Warren Worthington trying to remove his wings. And, oh, it's a hard scene to watch. I'm not going to show any more of it. But, man, that was, uh, that was intense. All right, so then we finally get to the OG trilogy. So I am placing it in 2003. Most people do place it there. But we're going to talk about how that is a problematic placement. There are issues with it. So why 2003? Well, first of all, the movie tells us it's in the not-too-distant future. The movie was released in 2000, so sometime after 2000, it seems, the movie has to be from a timeline standpoint. However, they do say, Logan, it's been almost 15 years, hasn't it? And Professor X is talking about how long Logan has lost his memory. Well, if he was shot with the adamantium bullet in 1979, you add 15 years, you get 1994. So a lot of people do place it in 1994, and I totally respect that placement if that's where you put it. However, that is not in the distant future, so it's kind of like you have to decide, do you trust this or do you trust this? Now, normally I would trust this because 15 years is so specific, but we're going to see other reasons it needs to be a little bit later in the timeline uh, as we get into the rest of the trilogy. Okay, so then we move to X-Men uh, United, which has come out in 2003, and it's also being placed in 2003. So why? Well, because... In it, Stryker sees Wolverine and says, how long has it been, 15 years? So that seems to imply that both X-Men 1 and X-Men United are happening in the same year, in the same uh, time frame. Another big hint is that Cyclops says, ever since Liberty Island, which was the climactic battle in the first X-Men movie, you've been, you've been different. A month ago, you had to concentrate just to, just to levitate a book or a chair across the room. So... He's basically saying the first movie is a month ago from the second movie or around a month ago. Okay, so that's why they're both being placed in the same year, 2003. Why though 2003? Well, because then we need to move to the last stand because you really have to look at all three together to try to figure out where to place them in the timeline. In the last stand, 
they also say the not too distant future. So that's the second time they've said this. They really seem to be indicating these movies are happening just shortly after they're being released in the real world. This was released in 2006. So it's literally being placed by most people in 2006 because it also needs to tie pretty close, relatively, to X-Men United. Because notice Wolverine saying, maybe it's time for us to move on, referring to Gene, who dies in the second movie. Uh, but um, Cyclops says, not everybody heals as fast as you, Logan. So it's believable that this is three years later. That's certainly believable. It takes a long time to get over the death of someone as close to them as Gene was. But at some point, it, it, it's got to be relatively close. So if, the, so if we put the, the first two X-Men movies way back in 1994, you know, you're talking a long time between these two movies. So you can see why it all kind of shifts to this 2006, 2003 timeline. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Um, I would say though, most people place the movies uh, similar to how I've got them here. All right, one important thing is we get a first look at the Sentinels because they're fighting them in the danger room. And of course, if they're fighting them in the danger room, they probably fought them in real life. And remember, I mentioned Trask was assassinated by Mystique back in 1973. That's what kicked off the Sentinel program. So it makes sense that we're seeing the Sentinel program clunky in this case, but still the Sentinel program being worked on. We're definitely gonna see more of that in a moment. All right, also, I will mention, they do try to explain how Professor X returns. He, he dies in this movie, and then in the post credit scene, seems to come back. So I totally get that he put his, his mental, his psychic uh, presence inside this other body. I get that. But why does it look like him? I guess I've heard rumors it's his brother. Okay, that would explain it, but I guess twin brother? <laughs> so I, it is a weird scene. Um, there's just a lot of issues with the X-Men timeline. But anyway, nonetheless, this is the explanation that this is how he comes back because we're going to see him in just a second here. In The Wolverine, uh, I'm placing that in 2013 because they don't really give us any timeline hints. And worst case, if you don't have any, you place it in the year it came out. It's not great. I hate that. But they just don't give us anything. They do then say, though, the epilogue is two years later. So if the movie's in 2013, the epilogue is in 2015. And what happens in the epilogue? Well, we see the return of Professor X. So again, whatever body he went into in 2003 has to look a lot like his original body because that looks like him, right? But also we see Magneto returning as well uh, in this epilogue. Okay, now we get to the gifted. So this one's interesting. Um, they don't give us any indication of when it's happening in the timeline specifically, like exactly the year. So I'm going to use the years it came out, 2017 and 2018. By the way, this is on Hulu. If you've never seen it, check it out. It's, 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 it's really interesting. But uh, the question is, is it part of the main timeline or not? Well, there are some hints, I guess you could say, uh, because Blink does appear in both The Gifted, you see here on the left, and in Days of Future Past, which is just about to come up uh, in, in the timeline. And in fact, here we see her using her powers in... Um, the Gifted on the left and in Days of Future Past on the right. So I, I'm not saying that means it has to be the same Blink, but it works, right? It's different actress, different actress, but really makes sense that it would be the same Blink. I like that. Lorna Dane does appear. And while it doesn't happen in The Gifted that she dates Havoc in the comics, she did. So that's kind of a tie to the Havoc that was in um, X-Men First Class. But I, I get it, not necessarily a guarantee. Here we do see uh, Polaris, Lorna Dane, with more her comic book ap accurate headband. I thought that was really cool. But it is worth noting she's held in plastic prisons the same way Magneto was held in uh, some of the earlier X-Men movies in the timeline. Uh, so that's kind of cool. But I really like this. So the antagonists are the Hellfire Club, but also Sentinel Services, right? And these are definitely different Sentinels, really creepy bug-like creatures. But you can imagine that the um, uh, Trask and uh, or Trask's organization, rather, because he's assassinated, but the government is creating lots of different types of Sentinels experimenting around. And this explains how they do get to those final Sentinel versions we see in Days of Future Past. So I like it. To me, it ties in really well. Uh, I think it belongs in the timeline. But let's see what the creator had to say about it. So Matt Nix says, generally, I think of one of the great favors that Days of Future Past did for us was establish that there are many streams. I think he probably means time streams, but regardless, streams. The short answer is we exist in one of those streams. It's its own universe. That said, we do share some things with the comics and the movies, but the idea is we're doing our own thing. Okay, if you read that, that would make you say, oh, it's not the same timeline. 
Okay, I get it. Then this is a longer quote. I'm not going to read this whole thing. You can if you want. But the real key here is, he says, now the movies for a time have been telling stories for a time that if you look at them are completely incompatible with each other on a timeline level. That's funny. Yes. Yes, Matt, I agree. <laughs> We've talked about some of those incompatibilities. And then he says, we exist in our own universe that's related to everything that's gone on. What does that mean? You're in your own universe, but it's related. Anyway, this would also make you think it's a different timeline. So if I just read those two quotes, I'd be like, nope, nope, it's not in the main timeline. This one though, I'm gonna read this whole thing because this is so important. He says, to find a way around the hurdle, and the hurdle being that they didn't want him to make this in the same timeline, and Nix wanted it to be though. So Matt says, I was just the guy that came in with the best idea for staying out of the way of the movies, which was, hey, remember in Days of Future Past, how they go back in time, and then there's an Anna Munit dystopia in the future, and then in, in this time, it looks like our time. So using that era as the setting for the gifted meant that nothing that happened would affect the movies. He says, just give me the years in between, and then my show will get erased. It doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't touch your movie timeline because it's a timeline you erased. So just give me that, I'll do that, and I'll sort of show how mutants came to be oppressed, and then I can stay out of the way of the movies. I love it. So he's basically saying, let me go in the timeline that, that you already erased, because it doesn't matter then. I can fit right in there. That's kind of funny. But he's right, by the way. He's right. That's why it fits so well. And then one, uh, so no, he says, just give me those years in between. That is really, really important. All right. But this is funny. Emma Dumont, who plays Polaris, says, well, I will say, yeah, I mean, the movies don't even align. Let's be honest. Sometimes the comics don't align. It's totally different. What I will say, we could fit. Well, we have many Sentinels, so obviously it'd be before the future part of Days of Future Past. Okay, so between what she said and that other quote from Matt Nix, I think it fits. So this is the timeline up to this point that, that I think makes sense. So we have First Class, Wolverine Origins, the main trilogy, The Wolverine, and then I'm putting The Gifted here in 2017 to 2018. Let me know your thoughts in the comments. I know a lot of people you know, don't feel it belongs, but at least let me know your honest thoughts. Does it at least fit? I mean, are there any contradictions if it were to fit there? I, I think it works. Okay, now we move to Days of Future Past. Unbelievable movie. Notice in the lower left, there's the Sentinels from Days of Future Past. And again, I just like the fact that we saw them in The Last Stand. We saw them in The Gifted. And now finally, we're seeing uh, the ones that basically wipe everybody out. But it also occurs in 1973 because they send Wolverine's consciousness in 2023 back to his consciousness in 1973. Uh, and of course, it had the awesome in the lower right there, um, uh, the Quicksilver scene was, I mean, maybe one of my favorite scenes in any X-Men movie, but maybe top 10 in the MCU, to be honest. So, so good, so good. But why do we say 1973 and 2023? Well, they give us some good indication because Professor X in 1973, the younger version, says, wait, 50 years from now? Like, the future 50 years from now, that's where you're from? So we get the 50 right there, right? And then we know for certain the movie the, in the past is in 1973, because they talk about the Paris Peace Accords. Remember, I discussed those earlier. After the Vietnam War, that's when she found Trast and assassinated him. And notice, this newspaper actually is in the movie, and they're establishing, which is actually the same as in real history, that the Paris Peace Accords were in January of 1973. So literally, the 1973 scenes are in January. And that's why I think it's important. We saw the Wolverine member, he was there, having a little afternoon delight uh, in the movie, right? Here he is here uh, with uh, some random person. Uh, no, somebody he was working for and supposed to be protecting her instead of uh, you know spending time with her. But so we know that Wolverine in January of 1973 was here. But we also know that he and Sabretooth were captured in Vietnam, I'm guessing at the very end of the war. So he must have gone back in for a last little run in Vietnam and, uh, and that happened after this scene. But of course, they're gonna rewrite all that. So I'm just kind of trying to place for you how I do believe this actually works with Wolverine Origins chronology really well. Okay, so what happens to Wolverine in the new 1973? Because they're rewriting it all. So Wolverine Origins is gone. All of those OG X-Men uh, movies and The Gifted are all wiped out. 
So Wolverine falls in the bottom of the ocean, has those nasty, or in the lake, has those nasty metal bars coming out of him. And then we get this weird scene. If anybody can explain it, let me know. But that's Stryker, the same one that's going to put the adamantium in him. But then the Mystique eyes show up. What is going on there? I do believe they had some ideas for what they were going to do, and then they dropped it. So the bottom line is it ends up being Stryker gets a hold of him, not uh, Mystique. But we'll see that in just a minute. But then Wolverine wakes up in 2023. And now everybody that was killed in the previous movies is back. They're all back, uh, happy as can be. And I love this comment. Professor X says, welcome back, which definitely implies that both Professor X and Wolverine, and maybe only Professor X and Wolverine, remember the original timeline and the new timeline. That is gonna come up big time down the road. So keep that in mind. They're aware of both timelines. Very, very cool. Okay, so again, let's look at our timeline. Now we've added in X-Men uh, Days of Future Past in 2023, and then I'm gonna draw this with a line like that. I realize they rewrote time, it's not a branch. They literally, it's a back to the future. They, they rewrote time, but I don't know how else to draw it in this diagram, so that's why I'm doing that. X-Men First Class still happened in this timeline, but everything else was wiped out. Although we do know that there is that you know, the new scene in 2023 that we were going to have to deal with. And it, it'll actually work. I thought for a while it didn't work, but actually it, it does. Pretty cool. Okay, but the big question is, how can time travel work so differently in the X-Men universe rather than in the MCU? Because as Hulk explained, if you travel to the past, that past becomes your future, and your former present becomes the past, which now can't be changed by your new future. <laughs> so I love that statement. It's crystal clear, and yet incredibly confusing at the same time. But what he's basically saying is if you go in the past, you can't change it. You're creating a new future. Basically, you're branching. So how on earth are they able to do what they do in the X-Men movies? Well, I have long time theorized that the X-Men universe is a different alternate universe and 616, the main MCU, is, is one universe. So they're separate. In the same way, we have a paint and we have an animated. Each of those have a different Big Bang, a different origin point, and as we know, the stones, the Infinity Stones, were created out of those Big Bangs. So, clearly the reality stone in the paint, love me some paint, the paint universe and the animated universe, that's a different reality stone because it created a different reality. So you can see, can you see where I'm going with this, right? That would mean that in the X-Men universe, the time stone was formed differently, and it did allow the rewriting of time. While in the Marvel Universe, in the 616, it creates branches. I don't really have an issue with that. Um, I think it makes, I mean, heck, if, if a rally stone can create paint, then the time stone can create a different way that time travel works. Okay, that works. Maybe they're going to explain that. I'd love it if they did that in Deadpool 3. I kind of doubt it. So we kind of have to create our own explanation. But let me know your thoughts. Does that, does that work? But anyway, all right, so let's continue on. Now, to really drive this point home, Wolverine now has two paths that he took. The top half is the original timeline where he joined uh, Team X, got his adamantium claws, and then got shot with the adamantium bullet. The new timeline, he falls in the lake with the metal, fake striker retrieves him, and then ultimately real striker gives him his adamantium claws, which we're going to see in a minute uh, in the Apocalypse movie. So two different timelines, top one erased, bottom one is the new one, but he remembers both. Again, that will be important. And it's also worth noting, everything that happened before still happened. So him fighting in the Civil War, World War I, World War II in Vietnam, those things all happened. It's everything up to 1973. Okay, so in the new timeline, what's the first thing we know about? Well, in 1975, we see Jean Grey's parents die. Don't wanna give away any spoilers. Let's just say it might be less clear cut than this indicates. But anyway, her parents seem to die. All right, so then, we jump to, and that's from, by the way, uh, Dark Phoenix. This is a flashback from Dark Phoenix. All right, so then we have X-Men Apocalypse. That comes out, uh, or sorry, that, well, it did come out in 19, or it doesn't come out in 1983, sorry. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, it came out in 1983. Anyway, it is in the timeline in 1983. And notice in the lower right, you can see uh, Logan is uh, getting his adamantium. That's where we're gonna see him get his new set of claws. But how do we know this takes place in 1983? Well, there's a newscast referring back to uh, Days of Future Past. It says this news comes at a time when the world is celebrating 10 years of peace between mutants and mankind. So the movie takes place 10 years after 1973, ergo 1983. 
Also, there is an unbelievably important epilogue in the movie, uh, or a post credit scene, really. So it is a Essex slash Mr. Sinister Easter egg. Notice they've got a, blo- a vial of blood from Weapon X, and they're putting it in a briefcase labeled Essex Corp. Essex, of course, is the uh, shadow organization that uh, Mr. Sinister uses for his nefarious deeds, and this scene is going to come up tying three other movies together with this movie. Crazy. Three movies which many people debate are all tied together. So this is going to get interesting. All right, so don't forget this. Okay, so then we move on to Dark Phoenix. The movie did not come out in 1992, but it did take place in the timeline in 1992. So uh, how do we know that? Well, they tell us, 1992. And it's really key is that's the launch of the space shuttle uh, in, in 1992, which in real life was also in 1992, in particular in September of 1992. So we know the month of this movie. And in fact, notice that that's almost the exact picture that they used from the actual space shuttle launch. So very cool. And by the way, this space shuttle launch has, plays a key role in the movie. We won't go into any more uh, spoilers or anything, but it, it just does play a very key role in the events. Okay, by the end... It seems like Jean Grey dies, and it seems like she becomes integrated into the Phoenix, and the Phoenix takes off. So I at first thought, well, this is never going to be able to connect with that scene that we saw in Days of Future Past, because Jean Grey's in that scene. So I thought they didn't connect at first, but some very wise commenters said, no, no, we actually see Phoenix still flying around, see her right up there, uh, above the Earth, kind of guarding the Earth. So it seems that Jean Grey was absorbed into the Phoenix, they became one, but the Phoenix and Jean are working together to, you know, keep the Earth safe, and maybe, maybe, they don't ever explain it, but hey, we can go with this explanation, maybe that's how Jean Grey returned here, is that the Phoenix Force lets her turn back into human form, which is wild to think that that's also the Phoenix standing there in that case. Whew, I tell you, this timeline, it, it takes some work, but you can make it all kind of come together. But all right, so here's again the timeline so far, and now we're going to pop in Dark Phoenix. And now, uh, like I said, that Dark Phoenix in 1992, it does actually tie to Phoenix showing up in 2023. So love it, love it. It's all working out so well so far. Okay, so then we move to Deadpool. Uh, Unless I'm missing it, tell me if I'm missing it, I don't think there's anything in this movie that tells us when it occurs. They don't give us any hints whatsoever. So I'm going to go with 2016, the year it came out, even though I really hate doing that, but really have no other option. They do, however, tell us that the events of the movie started two years ago. So that's when Deadpool goes through, uh, you know, all the experimentation and stuff that happens to him. So that's, this scene would have been in 2014 then, leading up into uh, eventually 2016 in the movie. So I'm not going to read this whole quote, but this is really interesting as Simon Kimberg, the producer, talks about the Deadpool timeline. And he mentions that it exists in a post Days of Future Past post-apocalypse world where all of these stories are the same as our shared history. Wild. Now, you can see he also mentions the Gambit movie, which never came out, but at the time they thought it was going to, and that's the one that would have had Channing Tatum as, as Gambit. But theoretically, some of that blood from Weapon X was used in the experimentation that led to Deadpool. So remember the blood from the Apocalypse movie? That was by Essex Corp. And we're going to see that Essex actually does make an appearance, not in Deadpool, not in the first Deadpool, but certainly in the second one. But the most important thing here is, this is the producer saying they're in the same world. Okay, well, if they're in the same world, then I'm putting in the same world. Uh, But we're going to really see how Deadpool 2 totally ties into everything. Hang on, though. We'll get to that in a moment. Here's the one where I have a new year. I don't think I've seen anybody place New Mutants in 2017. I originally had it in 2020, the year that it was uh, released. It wasn't filmed then, but it was released, and remember the pandemic kind of messed everything up, the sale of Fox to Disney, etc. But I'm going to go with 2017. I'll show you why in a minute. I would love your feedback on this. But let's first talk about which timeline is the New Mutants in. Well, this quote's interesting from New Mutants Updates uh, that says Josh Boone has confirmed that the New Mutants early draft would have featured the mutants in the X-Mansion with Xavier and Storm reprising their roles. The movie was supposed to be in an X-Men apocalypse timeline, but was later dropped to make it standalone. Well, that seems really clear that A, they were going to make it connected, and B, they decided not to ultimately. So let's keep that in mind. And then here's a bit of a longer quote. I'm not going to read all of it, but notice uh, he confirms it was meant to be part of a trilogy. Wouldn't that have been cool? 
I mean, I, New Mutants isn't the best movie ever, but it's okay, especially on rewatch. I liked it a lot better. I would have loved to have more. But he says, this is weird, it's obviously in the same universe, but it's not tethered to Dark Phoenix universe. Huh? <laughs> what? I think he's trying to describe the multiverse here or maybe, you know, alternate timelines. But, but anyway, he's still, he's saying it's not tethered to Dark Phoenix universe. Okay, I, I hear him loud and clear. Twice they've said it is not connected. But I'm going to show you some massive connections, and I really think it is connected. I, they, they can say it's not all they want, but the movie seems to indicate it's connected. So let's look at this stuff. First of all, we get a giant Essex slash Mr. A sinister Easter egg, because this is on a computer monitor that one of the bad, the main villain is using. And notice even the diamond. That is very similar to the diamond on Mr. Sinister's head. They're totally hinting at Mr. Sinister. Okay. Also, then somebody asks, what's Essex Corp? And the, our main villain says, it's a scientific organization founded by my superiors. Okay. So she works for Essex, and the superiors presumably is Mr. Sinister. And remember, Essex Corp. We saw that Essex Corp back in uh, Apocalypse movie. Then this one's crazy. So Danny gets a vision, and she's asked, where are you? And she's saying, well, what is this place? And notice what she sees in her vision are these two little kids, and notice the number zero, 01. Well, <laughs> this exact scene, like as in exact scene, is in Logan. In Logan, they're watching the scene on a, a, a video recording that had been done a few years earlier, and we'll get to that in a minute. But look at this. That's the same scene. I mean, they're totally tying Logan and uh, New Mutants together. And because of the Essex reference, they're really tying it back to Apocalypse as well. And then look at this scene. This is Danny's vision from New Mutants. This is the recording that we see in Logan. I mean, my word. It's, the, it's obviously the exact same scene. So then Danny says, Essex Corporation. That must have been the place I saw. So that's tying Logan's Transigen organization, because Transigen is the facility where we saw that recording, with Essex. And there'll be more ties, but that's another big tie between Logan and New Mutants. Crazy. And then, this is interesting, though. The video recording in Logan was recorded in December of 2026. So, does that mean the New Mutants has to be after December of 2026? I mean, how does Danny see a vision from the future? Well, maybe she can, first of all. So that's something we just have to decide. Was Danny seeing a future vision, or is New Mutants after December of 2026? We'll talk about that in a minute. Here's another timeline hint. We see a calendar in Danny's room. And the calendar, as you can see, it's, it's, it's dim, I know, but you can see 28 days. So it's clearly February. It's not a leap year because there's no 29th day. And the first is a Wednesday because it goes from Sunday to Saturday. Okay, I mean, sometimes you can't trust these things. They just happen to have been in the room when the scene was filmed. But I'm going to go with this because it does help us place this. So we have uh, Wednesday the 1st of February uh, showing up in the movie. Okay? Then also we know that they were they thought, at least, they were being prepped to join the X-Men. So clearly the X-Men have to be around or they couldn't have thought that, and that'll be important in a minute. Then, since it's tied to Logan, I mean, she saw the same thing that's in the Logan movie, we can look at Logan for a couple hints. And we're going to get to the Logan movie in a second. But for the New Mutants' sake, they mention in Logan... Many are noting the similarity to the Westchester incident over a year ago that left over 600 injured and took the lives of seven mutants, including several of the X-Men. So we're going to see that Logan is in 2029. We'll get to that in a moment. But a year prior, 2028, Professor X, unfortunately, had a psychic attack that killed some of the X-Men. So that's important because if in New Mutants they're talking about going to be X-Men, it can't happen after, you know, half of them get killed in a psychic attack. But this one's even more important. They're the ones that tied this to, the, to, to Logan, right? I mean, New Mutants intentionally tied itself to Logan. Well, in Logan, he says, there are no New Mutants. That's kind of funny. He doesn't mean the New Mutants movie, by the way, but that is funny. Anyway, he says, understand, there hasn't been a new one born in 25 years, not anywhere. The movie takes place in 2029, so this is saying there are no New Mutants since 2004. That's important. And we also learn that the new mutants, no surprise, but they're teenagers because they say this is a facility for young mutants like yourself, teens who need some extra care before they can go on to live healthy adult lives. Woof. So let's take all this together. So 
in Logan, we learn that no new mutants were born after 2004, but we also know the mutants, the new mutants are teenagers, likely 16 or 17. So this movie cannot have taken place before, uh, or after rather, uh, 2020 or maybe 2021, depending on their ages. And that's right at the point where no more were born. We do know Professor X is still running his school, but that he accidentally kills some of the X-Men in 2028, so it's gotta be before 2028, but it, really it's gotta be before 2021, let's be honest. So that must mean Danny's seeing a future vision. That's the only thing I can guess because they can't have it both ways. The movie can't refer to one part of Logan and not another part. So I think she was seeing a vision of the future. And then finally, let's bring the calendar in. If you look you know, at historical days uh, in, in, in the real world, Wednesday, February 1st in a non-leap year occurs in 2017. So, wow. That's why I'm going with 2017. Let me know your thoughts. I've, I honestly have never seen anybody place it in 2017, but I think this just makes a lot of sense. So I'm plugging it in here. I mean, there's some people that don't even think it's part of the regular X-Men timeline, and that's fair. If you don't, I respect that. But let me know your comments. I'd love your feedback on this placement. All right, Deadpool 2 is nowhere near as difficult. It doesn't even give us any indication when it's, uh, the main part is happening, so I gotta go with 2018. I hate doing that, but it came out in 2018, so we go with that. But they do give us an indication of where Cable came from because uh, Wade says, I bet 50 years from now, we're bestest buddies. And he says, no, 50 years from now, you're very dead. So for Cable to know what happened 50 years from now, which seemingly would be 2068 since the movie's in 2018, would mean, you know, it has to be around 2068 timeframe because he knows what happened in 50 years. However, I will point this out. A very astute viewer of one of my earlier videos left a comment saying, hey, a behind the scenes video shows 2054 on the wall in uh, Cable's home. And I want to give credit to the person, X person 838, great find, love it. So what do we do with this, right? Well, we got to keep in mind behind the scenes stuff is behind the scenes. It, it didn't make it in the movie. So if it helps in placing stuff, we should use it. In this case, it, it goes against that line because they were talking about 50 years in the future. Well, if it's in 2054, that's only 36 years in the future. So obviously Cable wouldn't know what happened in 2068 uh, if the movie was in 2054. So bottom line, I, I, I'm not gonna use 2054, but I wanted to point it out because I think X person 838 at least raises a good argument that that could be. Um, all right. Here we go with another Easter egg on Essex. The main battle in the movie happens at the Essex House for Mutant Rehabilitation. Wow. So remember, this is the same Essex Corp that we saw in uh, Apocalypse and the same one in New Mutants. Here it is again. And, and, and kind of, at least from Deadpool's origin, is implied even in the first Deadpool movie that it's tied to Essex. So, okay, I, I really think these are indications that Deadpool and Deadpool 2 are in the main timeline. Um, then we get this X-Men Easter egg, which I realize some people have said it's just Deadpool being silly and this really isn't the X-Men. Uh, but hey, I, I look at it and say it fits. So I'm fine with this actually being really happening. We just don't know. But it works that the X-Men would be around in 2018. Uh, and then, of course, we get more of the time travel, right? But we've already explained that time travel works differently in the X-Men universe. So this teddy bear that changes from the grimy teddy bear because of the explosion in 2068 now turns nice and clean because Cable rewrites time and fixes everything. And likewise, so does Wade. He, uh, Deadpool, he saves Vanessa, saves his team, kills crappy Deadpool, and kills Ryan Reynolds before he becomes um, Green Lantern. So yeah, I just think time travel works differently in uh, the Fox universe. It'll be interesting to see if they touch on that in Deadpool 2, or Deadpool 3 rather. I kind of doubt it, but again, I think it works and that's what's important. So now we can plug in Deadpool 2. Okay, we're almost done. Uh, that, oh, sorry. Then we also should add in 2068 is when Cable, you know, came back from the future. So to be consistent, I have to say it got rewritten again. Now, everything before 2018 was not rewritten. So all of that still stays the same. And I'm even going to include the 2023 um, X-Men, you know, cameo that we saw in the end of Days of Future Past as still happening because... We saw the X-Men there at the X-Mansion in 2018 in Deadpool 2. It would fit that five years later, they're still there, right? And still active and going strong. Okay, now, now we're almost done. Let's talk about Logan. So I've mentioned a couple times it takes place in 2029. Why do we know that? Well, we do see in the movie that his driver's license, driver ID, expires in 2029. 
So that's helpful, but even more helpful is they legit say it's 2029. <laughs> okay, great. That made it easy, right? Uh, so when does this thing happen? What timeline? So again, you can read this whole quote if you want, but this is the real key part here. James Mangold, so this is the guy that you know worked on the movie, says, I wanted to get far enough past the end of Days of Future Past. So he's literally talking about the epilogue in Days of Future Past as still happening, and he wanted this movie to be past that, far enough past that. So to me, I think that's enough to say, yeah, it's in the same timeline. However, people have pointed out in this quote, you can see up at the top, Hugh Jackman said it's a slightly different universe. So I've seen some people say, nope, Logan's a different universe. I get that. But here again is Mangold saying, no, it takes place approximately five years after the conclusion of Days of Future Past. So I, I'm not trying to diss on Jackman. I, I love you, Jackman. But sometimes the actors are just saying something that they heard at one point. But here is basically Mangold saying, no, it's all in the same timeline. And I'm going to show eight different ways that this movie, Logan, refers back to either the original timeline or the new timeline. Because remember, I said Professor X and Logan both remember the original and the revised timeline. So in this scene, Logan says, careful, you're speaking to a man who ran a school. And Professor X says, yes, it was a special needs school. Well, of course, he's referring to the school for gifted, gifted youngsters. So that's a loose tie. I mean, it could have been a different X-Men. I, I get that. But it is showing he definitely is the same professor that ran the school. But this one's huge. He says, they're waiting for you at the Statue of Liberty. And Logan says the Statue of Liberty was a long time ago. Well, of course, they're referring to the, uh, the final battle in the first X-Men movie at the Statue of Liberty. Wow, that's a major connection back to the original timeline. Then Professor X says, when I found you, you were pursuing a career as a cage fighter. Well, in the first movie, Logan was pursuing a career as a cage fighter. <laughs> so another reference back to the first movie. Then we get the dog tags, and notice it's the exact same number as the dog tags in uh, Origins Wolverine, uh, X2, etc. So uh, he must have gotten the same dog tag in the revised timeline, but it's a tie back to really both timelines in that regard. Uh, then we have Caliban saying, I found this in your pocket, sniffs it, it's an adamantium bullet. That's a tie back to that adamantium bullet that made him lose his memory. Could have killed him, but didn't, but made him lose his memory. But in Logan, because he's in a weakened state, it would kill him. So this is a tie back. And this is a looser tie, but I still think it's interesting. Uh, Professor X says, she's your daughter, Logan. Alkali has your genetic code. If Alkali sounds familiar, that's because Alkali Lake was where Logan's, in the original timeline, got his adamantium. So presumably the company that whose name was used to name Alkali Lake is the same company in Logan. Very interesting. This one's a better tie though. Look at the samurai sword on his wall. Yep, that is the samurai sword from the Wolverine. So again, another tie back to the original timeline. And then finally we get this massive tie to the revised timeline where this dude says, I'm Xander Rice. I believe you knew my father on the Weapon X program. Yes, that is the Weapon X program from the Apocalypse movie. And Logan replies by saying, yeah, I'm pretty sure I killed him. Well, he did kill just about everybody in that uh, facility as he went through and mowed them all down. So that is eight ties, most of them really strong, some eh, but most really strong ties back to either the first timeline or the new timeline. I really think this is in the same um, overall X-Men timeline. Uh, then also, we get this comment about uh, the uh, X-Men Apocalypse uh, post-credit scene. And notice they were saying straight up, this was a tease for Mr. Sinister. I've been mentioning that all along. But yeah, Essex Corp, the Weapon X, um, that was a tease for Mr. Sinister. Then this is really key. So then uh, Mangold says, uh, when oh, sorry, Kinberg says, when asked specifically if X-Men Apocalypse and credit sequence and Logan are directly connected King, Kimberg, sorry, Kingbird, Kingberg, my word, <laughs> confirmed, yes, that is the implication. So again, you've got them saying, this is in the X-Men timeline. This is tied back to X-Men Apocalypse. I don't know what else to do with that. I respect anybody that says it's not the same timeline, uh, and that's fine. But I'm just looking at all this, and they're saying, yes, it is. So that means all of these Essex connections uh, are all tied together. So from uh, Apocalypse, from New Mutants, from Deadpool 2, and from Logan. It was all Mr. Sinister. Man, I really wish he would have shown up, but I hope, 
I hope he ends up being a villain in um, the live action. And of course, he's a big time villain in X-Men and uh, X-Men 97. So I'm going to put Logan in the timeline. Um, I, uh, again, if you don't agree with that, that's fine. Let me know in the comments. But I really think it fits. I, I like it. I don't see any issues. And so it's just fun to have it all be tied together. All right, last thing to talk about is Legion. Three really, really good, crazy seasons. If you've never seen it, it's on a Hulu still, so you can check it out. Uh, all right, so let's talk about this. So David Holler, main character, has disassociative identity disorder. That's the same thing Moon Knight had, although it's handled very differently in this series. You can see how trippy it is. I mean, it, it is a wild series. Uh, also, he is Charles Xavier's son, and that's Charles there. And at one point, they even appear together uh, in a, in a uh, time kind of a t trippy time travel thing, but anyway, you'll have to watch it if you want to know more. It was cool, though. It was really cool. So what facts do we learn about Charles and David? We learn that Charles was a British soldier in World War II. At some point after the war, he was committed to a mental hospital where he met Gabrielle. He helped bring her out of a catatonic state and used his powers to coerce the hospital into releasing them. They were married and soon after had a child named David, and David seems to be in his 20s to 30s. So I bring this up for a couple reasons. Number one, that pretty much makes it clear that this is not the same Professor X. Because remember, we saw that Professor X in the original and the revised timeline, because that wasn't rewritten, he wasn't in World War II. He was sitting in his Westchester mansion meeting Raven. So this is not the same Professor X. I do not believe Legion is tied at all to uh, the X-Men timeline. I'm going to talk about something about Dark Phoenix in a minute, in case you're getting ready to write a comment. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but then also this kind of helps us with the timeline. It's because if, if he was in World War II, then got out, went to a mental hospital, eventually got out there and had David, who's now in his 20s to 30s, you can kind of do that math, places the movie in the late 70s, early 80s, somewhere around there. Another big timeline hint from season one is that David is taken to Summerland for experimentation on him. It used to be a horse ranch. It was inherited in the 1940s, and the current facility, Summerland, was built 30 years ago. They say all of that in episode three, I believe. So again, it kind of puts it, you can do the math, in the mid-70s, late 80s. It's weird because the technology in the series is very advanced at times, but if it's a different universe, or at least a different timeline, that's no problem. All right, so the main antagonist is the Shadow King. You can see he has all kinds of different forms, creepy forms throughout the series. One of them being played by Aubrey Plaza down there in the lower right, who is also going to be in Agatha's series coming up. She's awesome in Legion. I bet she's going to be awesome in uh, Agatha's series. So I mentioned Dark Phoenix, and some people have said, hey, there's a big time tie to Dark Phoenix that places Legion in the main timeline. So let's talk about that. This image is David being watched uh, on a monitor, and the people watching him are these two gentlemen having this conversation. They say, are we clear on the scope and nature of the power, of his power? No, but if the readings are right, he may be one of the most powerful mutants we have ever encountered. Well, after what happened in Red Hook, I'd say that's an understatement. So Red Hook, when people saw that, they went, oh, wait, 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 Dark Phoenix. In Dark Phoenix, the police, as you can see from their car, were in Red Hook. So the incident in Red Hook, they believe, is what's being referenced here. Well, there's a couple things. Number one, Legion came out two years before Dark Phoenix. So it seems unlikely they would be referring to something that the viewer wouldn't even know about. But more importantly, if you read the context of this quote, they're not talking about some other incident. They're talking about David's incident and how that incident showed that it might be an, uh, an understatement to say he's the most powerful mutant around. In fact, later in the series, in fact, in the first season, they mentioned, now let's talk about the incident at Clockworks. So literally, in fact, Clockworks, by the way, is the psychiatric hospital he was at before this facility. So they're talking about his incident. So I, I totally respect if people believe this is tied to Dark Phoenix. I just don't think so based on the logic of what we see in the series. It, it seems like this is referring to a totally separate thing, but boy, I'll agree, Red Hook, to be in both, that is really suspicious. Uh, so anyway, that's my opinion. Let me know your thoughts. Now, let's talk about whether or not it is part of the main timeline. So this is interesting. They say Legion is part of the X-Men universe, but obviously we're on our own astral plane. Huh? <laughs> we're, our, we're our own world. That's one way of saying it, but that seems to imply it's it's not part of the of the main X Men timeline. Uh, and then this quote's funny. He says, "Yes, it's connected. No, I won't really care to tell how." Okay, I don't even know what to do with that, right? 
You're not helping. You're not helping. Uh, and then this quote's kind of interesting, too. There's a periodness to the movies, Hawley said, about the recent X-Men films, uh, when presented themselves, uh, which have presented themselves rather like montages from the 70s and 80s, referring to, you know, 1973, 1983, etc. Then they say, by hiding the period in Legion, the question is a little more open-ended, meaning we're not really telling you when it's happening. And that's true. It's very hard to tell when this series is happening. But I really think the biggest answer as to where this thing fits in the timeline that uh, Jeff Loeb, uh, who was the previous Marvel TV chief, he basically said it as simple as he could. The X-Men characters live in the Fox world and we live in a different world. So I, I really think Red Hook, coincidence aside, that there is just no ties. And the biggest reason I say that is not only this quote here, but Professor X's timeline, sorry, not timeline, his, his history, his backstory is totally different, totally different than in the X-Men movies. So therefore, I am gonna stick Legion like this. I don't even know whether to say it's 70s or 80s, so I'm gonna say either. You can tell me your thoughts, but I do not think it's connected. I want it on the timeline somewhere so it doesn't look like I forgot it, but I don't think it's connected. So there you go, that is the entire X-Men timeline. Now, I do wanna mention the Google timeline sheet because everything about the X-Men is in here. As you know, this thing is out on my Google Drive and I will put a pinned comment so you can find it. And it is sorted initially by timeline, month, and year because you know I love me the timeline. But you can sort it either way, either by timeline or by release. And you can also filter. So you can either filter online or you can download your own copy. But one of the things you can filter by is the Xverse. And if you do that, notice you get all of the X-Men movies in this timeline order where I think at least they all fit. If you think anything I've got here is wrong, let me know. I'm more than willing to look at it um, and, and change things around. But I really think this fits uh, really well. I, I love the X-Men timeline uh, in this order. It still has its issues, but it, it, it fits. By the way, I'm gonna do another video coming up on how I recommend watching the multiversal films like the X-Men, like the Spider-Man films, etc. So look for that to be my very next video. Um, but yeah, this at least is the timeline as I've laid it out and it is in the Google Doc. So don't forget we have the April contest. Be a subscriber, leave a comment, win a book or a steel book. And of course we have the membership option I discussed earlier. Plus we have the Discord. I always like to bring that up. You can see we do lots of different watches on the Discord. We have MMRPG. We have a Star Wars retrospective. That's gonna be a lot of fun. We know my thumbnails aren't that great. So we have a thumbnail contest for the next uh, Moon, uh, Moon Girl video. And we have lots of things you can chat about. We obviously talk about Star Wars, DC, and Marvel a ton, but we also have other media forums where you can discuss just about anything. So I will leave a pinned comment so you can join the Discord. 1,300 members across the globe, conversations 24-7. Also, if you don't mind, like this video, subscribe if you haven't already. You can check out more content, and we'll all continue to enjoy the ever-growing, ever-changing Marvel Cinematic Universe.